Well, we've said it before, life is a sexually transmitted terminal disease. The moment we're born, we begin to die. And it sounds bleak, I suppose, with the wrong perspective, but the point along the way is to discover our purpose in life. We have to receive a blessing, figure out what our identity is in Jesus Christ. We have to figure out what our role is in this life, and we have to accomplish that purpose so that when we get to the end, we can leave the same blessing behind. And today we're going to be finishing up our mini-series on David, on the life of David. We're going to be talking about leaving this blessing behind. I don't know if you think a lot about it, but what do you want to be said about you at the end of your life? How do you want to be remembered at the end of your life? What legacy do you want to leave behind? We begin that right now. And we see this in the life of David. Last week, we talked about one of the low points in David's life, Bathsheba, and the mistake that he made with Bathsheba, one of the most broadcast, widely publicized, often written about, even uh, depicted in film, one of the biggest mistakes of all time, right? Everybody makes mistakes. David, he made a mistake. He compounded, uh, compounded his affair with Bathsheba with a murder, which of course was a bad idea. And there were consequences that came. Now, right before this happened, uh, just a few years before, a handful of years, David had been given his blessing. The prophet had come to him, Samuel, and had told him years before, you're going to be king. And there were a lot of things that happened in between the time David was told he was going to be king and the time he became king. But when he ascended the throne in Hebron, not even in Jerusalem yet, he received a blessing and this blessing is something you and I have talked about the last two weeks, something I want you to receive. It's the context and the foundation for how we live our lives, for how we get to the end and be able to look back without regret. We find this in 1 Samuel 13, 14. Actually, first David was told, or Saul was told, that uh, he could no longer be king because uh, there needed to be a king who was after God's own heart. And let's move to the next passage here where David receives his challenge. Then David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that he had been exalted in his kingdom for the sake of his people, not his own sake. So David received his blessing and he understood his purpose. He understood that his purpose began with the people that were around him, that the projects that were going to be given to him were important, and that as he lived this purpose, that his life wasn't about him. And so you and I have to embrace that. If we don't embrace it, we don't really get anything else. Our lives are not about us, that we are put here to make a difference in the lives of the people who are around us. And as we discussed last week, it begins with those closest to us and it works itself out in concentric circles to where hopefully we influence people who we very rarely even or even briefly meet. But we go all the way back and drill all the way down and we find out that our success or failure oftentimes is determined by those who we see the most. So I want to talk to you a little bit about David's life in between the time when he received this blessing and the end of his life. And I want to illustrate to you that his life was not perfect, that it was super complicated, that there was all kinds of dysfunction and that he had challenges to be called at the end of his life, a man after God's own heart. Joy and I, when we watch Netflix, she spends the first 20 to 30 minutes of any show we watch Googling all of the actors, trying to find out who they are, how old they are, if they're married, if they're not married, what they've been in before. And for her, it's really important to define the players in the game and to understand. And so I want to give you a little glimpse into some of the characters in David's life, some of those that were closest to him, some who he succeeded with and around, and some who he had failed with and around. And I hope it encourages you, and it certainly encourages me, that you don't have to be perfect that what happened yesterday, perhaps we need to make amends for, but we certainly can't control or change. But what we can change is what we do right now and what we intend to do tomorrow. So after David had sinned with Bathsheba, after he had had Uriah, Bathsheba's husband killed, Nathan the prophet came to David and he said, there's going to be consequences for your sin. Interesting how every sin has consequence that's assigned to it. God forgives. God didn't take David's life. He removed his sin from him, but was told by the prophet, there will be consequences. There were some immediate consequences in that the child that he and Bathsheba were having ended up dying, but there were consequences that lasted in David's family that caused such heartache and drama 
that even those with the most dysfunctional families should be able to in some way relate. David had a son, his oldest son named Amnon. Amnon was in line for the throne to be the successor. And Amnon had a crush on his half-sister, Tamar. Now, it wasn't okay then. It's certainly not okay now. But they were family. They shared a same parent. And Tamar didn't even know that Amnon really existed. I mean, she knew he existed in theory. He was a person, but she had zero interest in him. And Amnon was obsessed with Tamar. And the Bible says he concocted a plot where he acted sick. How sick? Very sick. How long? Very long. Long enough to get David's attention. And David came to him and he said, uh, you're sick. Are you going to die? How can I help you? What do you need? And he said, what I need is my sister Tamar to come to make soup for me so that I can get better. Now, you know where he was heading. David didn't know. He said, sure, sounds reasonable to me. And so he sent Tamar and Tamar went in and all of a sudden Amnon felt better. Now, this is messed up, isn't it? I've told you before, if we made the Old Testament into a movie, uh, a lot of evangelical Christians would probably pick at the movie because it would just be too racy for us to go and to see this stuff really happened. This was really a family and these are real events. So the Bible says that all of a sudden Amnon felt better and propositioned Tamar. And she said, we can't do this thing. That's detestable. It's wicked. We're even related. And then the Bible says that because he was stronger than her, he did what he wanted and they had relations against her will. And then it even took a worse turn, if that's possible. The Bible tells us that when Amnon looked at her, he hated her, despised her even more than he had wanted her or thought he loved her and said, get up and get out. And in Old Testament times in this context, it was as good as a death sentence for a woman. But she had another half brother named Absalom who took her in and took care of her. King David said nothing. And time passed. And Absalom decided to take matters into his own hands. Now, Absalom is described as a pretty valiant warrior, somebody that probably went to the gym, knew some martial arts, was probably pretty good with the gun, and he had long flowing hair. His hair was so long and so full that he only cut it once a year because it got too heavy for his head because he couldn't move his head around, and it weighed five pounds. Absalom was full of himself, and Absalom was a charmer. And Absalom had taken Tamar in and was waiting and watching for something to happen to Amnon. And David did nothing. So after a couple of years passed, Absalom, David's third son, they believed the second son had died. Absalom decided to throw a dinner party. And he invited his dad, David, and David said, I can't possibly come. If I came, it would be crazy. You know, too much entourage and pomp and circumstance and your, ha your house couldn't handle it. And he said, well, how about if I invite my brothers? And um, David said, sure, sounds like a great idea. So Absalom, if you're following the cast of characters without Googling them in the middle of Netflix, I'm trying to give you some history. Absalom invited his brother Amnon and the rest of his brothers to this dinner party, but Absalom grabbed his henchmen and he said, look, when Amnon gets super drunk and he's having the best time of the entire night, I want you to go in and murder him in front of everybody. And they did. And the other brothers couldn't believe it. Amnon was laying dead. Absalom took off. The other brothers fled, made it back to the palace, terrified for their own lives. And David did nothing. Absalom waited, eventually wanting an audience with his dad. His dad, David, wouldn't receive him, wouldn't respond to his messages, left him on read. Absalom went to Joab, David's right-hand guy. Remember Joab from last week? The guy that would kill for David, would die for David, but would also commit crimes because he thought David might want him to. Absalom sent word to Joab and Joab said, look, you're on the blacklist. We don't get to talk to you. You don't exist to me. That's my paraphrase. So Absalom did what any reasonable person would do and he burned down Joab's house. So Joab came to Absalom, he's like, all right, you got my attention. What do you want? And he said, I want to see my dad. So Joab had to trick David into agreeing to see Absalom. Eventually David did. 
He laid hands on Absalom years past in between these circumstances. And Absalom thought things were going to be okay, but they weren't. David had said, okay, by laying hands and all was forgiven, but was not treating him the same. He was supposed to be the next person on the throne. He kind of squeezed him out, sort of cut him away from the family. So the Bible says that Absalom moved his people and set up camp right outside the city on the way to the city so that everybody who came in to see his dad, David the king, saw him first. And he said something like this, do you have a problem? friend that I could help you with. Oh, we're here to see the king. And they would bow low to Absalom. And he would run up to him and grab him by the hand and pick him up and kiss him and say, you don't have to bow to me. The king's way too busy for you. But wouldn't it be better if I was the judge of Israel? I would take care of your problems. And literally, as the people came to see King David in his palace, Absalom picked him off one by one until David's advisors said, Absalom has stolen the hearts of Israel. Everyone loves him, no one likes you. And so David, yep, the wind is certainly blowing in Absalom's favor. Heard that Absalom was coming for David to kill him. And David knew that everybody with him in Jerusalem, in the palace would be killed because of him. So David, left his throne, took off with his people, crossed the Jordan to go hide. Now, he was avoiding conflict with his son. In some ways it could be seen as positive, in some ways it could probably be seen as passive. I don't know his heart. But he was carrying with him the Ark of the Covenant, the presence, the symbol of the presence of God. And about halfway to this refuge city where David was going to go hide out that had walls and at least a place where he felt like he could be safe, he stopped and he said, listen, priest, take the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. This is where God or the presence of God should be. Let God do with me what he wants. If he sees fit to take me back to Jerusalem, so be it. If he's going to kill me and make me pay for my sins, I'm okay with that. So David and all of the people following David took off to this refuge city, got behind the walls and waited to see what Absalom was gonna do. Now, Absalom wasn't good with David hiding and leaving Jerusalem. He wanted his dad dead. Can you imagine the hatred to wanna pursue your dad and members of your family to the point where they were slaughtered? Well, David knew he couldn't run anymore He knew that the people he was with would pay the price for his quarrel with Absalom. And so David decided it was time to fight. Now, there's a great lesson here that you never fight until you have to fight. You allow every opportunity for God to intervene. But when you have to fight, fight well. David was old. David was wise. David had been through a lot of battles. So he took Joab And as I told you last week, remember that David would have his his soldiers divided, his mighty men, his 37 that usually were about 30 around him, divided into groups of three that were like special forces. Well, the top of this group of of three, Joab was the height. He was the leader. He had two guys that were his right-hand guys. David divided all of his troops into three parts. And he had the old guys, the gray beards, the ones with the scars. Absalom was young, brash, cocky, confident, thought for sure with his charisma and his driving determination that he would just wipe David off the face of the earth. But David had been down these roads before and had a plan. Before he gave him the plan, he called all of the leaders together and he said, I have one request. He said, kill everybody you have to kill, but be as gentle as you can with my son Absalom. If you can save his life, save his life because David thought there was a chance for Absalom to be restored to God. And friends, that's a great way for you to view or to relate to somebody who you perceive to be an enemy. God, restore a right relationship with them, but do it as gently as you possibly can. And so they went off with their orders. David split them into threes and he said, we're not gonna meet them out with a shield wall in the valley, force on force, might on might, because they outnumber us at least three to one. 
You guys go to the forest and meet him in the forest where a gray beard, some wise tactics, some trickery, some sneakiness could help. And the Bible says they met in the forest and that 20,000 of Absalom's soldiers were killed and even more than that, the forest consumed. I'm not 100% sure how the forest consumed more people than that, but they got lost, they died, I don't know. And Absalom was taken off on his mule and he had fluffy curly hair and he ran under a tree and his hair got caught in the tree and Absalom was hanging like a pinata. So the soldiers came to Joab and they said, did you see Absalom hanging like a pinata? And Joab says, why didn't you kill him? And they're like, we're not gonna kill him. David said, treat him gently. And Joab said, I know what David wants. I know exactly what David wants. And the Bible says he took three spears and rammed them through Absalom's heart and the rest of his soldiers destroyed him as he hung there from the tree. So David mourned the death of his son. Dealt some justice, gave some rewards, reluctantly went back to Jerusalem where he retook the throne and served the Lord as an old man for a few years until it was time for him to die. And at the very end of David's life, and I wanted to give you these things to tell you and to help you understand that we're not talking about a man who had a charmed life, who God said, you're the king, and he got to be king, and it was all roses and sunshine. That you're talking about a man who had seen and been through everything, yet still at the end of the day, had a heart that was soft toward God. We see at the end of his life, it's recorded in two sections of scripture. One, you'll see in 2 Samuel and 1 Kings. The other is retold in 1 Chronicles. And in your notes, you're gonna see passages from both because both provide more detail to form a complete story. But King David, as he was getting ready to die, and he wasn't an old man, he was in his 70s, early 70s when he passed away. He'd only been on the throne for about 40 years. He did four things. You see, he had received the blessing early in life. And the blessing was to accept the reality that his life was not for himself, that it was for other people. Now he had to leave the blessing behind. And he did four things. And these are the things that I want us to see. So pretend you're an old man or an old woman. Maybe for some of you, that's not that much of a, of a pretense. Some of us. If you're young, Think about living the kind of life that will allow you to leave this kind of blessing. If you're older, think about being intentional with the people and the projects in your life so that people can see this kind of blessing as you leave this kind of blessing because none of us know when our last day will be. David did. The Bible said he was cold and he was so cold that he couldn't get warm no matter how many blankets were given to him. So they found somebody to be his warmer. It was a platonic thing. It sounds a little weird, but they found a woman and like, your job is to keep David warm. And, and, uh, and she did because nothing else could even make him comfortable. Most of the time he couldn't even get out of bed. Come in time for him to go. And he did four things. The first thing that we see him do is he prayed a prayer. And it was a prayer of thanksgiving and thankfulness. And it went something like this. He said, God, every good thing that's happened to me in my life is because of you. And every bad thing I either had coming to me or I brought it on myself. It was a prayer of responsibility. It was a prayer of not shifting blame. It was a prayer of being accountable. And he said, God, you have given me so much, even though there have been some ups and downs. And the second thing that he did is he got his old bones himself off the bed and he went to church. And I think that's kind of weird. Now, it wasn't called church back then. It was the assembly. 
They did a few things. They prayed. They sang some songs to the Lord. And David was a poet and a musician. And then they celebrated the fact that the next generation was coming and that they were going to do a better job than they had. What a tremendous thing to be able to pray as a group of older men and women. The next generation is coming. Solomon's going to take the throne. He's got people, even his own family. And we've done everything we can to set the stage for them to be better than we were. Well, there's two more things that are coming, and Dan and I are going to talk to you about those in just a minute. But before we do that, we're going to sing a few songs. And I think you're going to enjoy the rest of this story every bit as much, or I hope more, as you've enjoyed the first part. Father, well, David left praying. He left churching, and he also left reflecting. David had a passion in life, and he felt like it was his purpose. It was the one thing that he wanted to accomplish before he died, and that was to build the temple. The Holy Spirit had given David specific instructions on how to build the temple. He knew how much things were supposed to weigh, what things were supposed to look like. I mean, he could visualize it. It was in his heart, brighter and in a more real way. Well, it was like he'd already done it. But he was informed that he wasn't going to be able to build the temple, that he had blood on his hands, that God was going to use somebody with a different temperament to fulfill David's passion, what he thought was his mission. And he realized it was going to be his son, Solomon. Now, Solomon was getting ready to be king, but there was even more drama in between Absalom and Solomon. It seemed like every time David didn't do what other people expected him to do and waited on the Lord, somebody stepped in and tried to take his kingdom from him. One of Saul's descendants had popped up right after Absalom and tried to steal the hearts of the people and take Israel. And the Bible has a great story about how Joab and David's soldiers chased him all the way to a city where he was taking refuge and they were going to pull the city down with ropes. A wise lady leaned over the wall and said, hey, what's the deal? And Joab said, this guy wants to kill David. And she said, well, give me 20 minutes. I'll throw his head over the wall. <laughs> and they did. But even before Solomon, another one of David's sons, Adonijah, same thing. He had so much traction that people were offering sacrifices and celebrating the fact that he was king. Bathsheba pops back on the scene along with Nathan the prophet who only shows up a couple of times. I think he wanted to keep his head low. He wanted to stay out of the drama. Convinced David that it was time to put Solomon on the throne for Adonijah to be dealt with and ultimately later he was killed because he came against Solomon in his reign. So David begins praying, 1 Corinthians, or first, excuse me, 1 Chronicles 28. And his prayer is pretty simple. He starts off talking about what he wished that he could have done with his life. And isn't it easy to be cynical and bitter and entitled if we think about all the things that we want to do, but not the things that we were able to do? And then it's almost as if he hits a pause and thinks better of it, and totally changes directions. And he said, even though I'm not going to be able to fulfill my dream, you chose me, a shepherd boy, out of all of my brothers. You chose my family out of all of the tribes, or all the people of the tribe of Judah. You chose, chose Judah of all the other tribes, and you allowed me to live this amazing life. And he literally chose to focus on what God allowed him to do, and not on the things that he wanted to do or wish that he could do. What a powerful attitude and perspective. One leads towards cynicism, bitterness, and a paralyzing regret. The other one leads to inspiration, to hope, and to influence of the next generations. 
So then David looks at his son Solomon, who, if you're counting, wasn't the first, he wasn't the second, that guy died somewhere. Wasn't the third, he got died, got died, got killed hanging from a tree. Wasn't the fourth, that fourth one was sort of in banishment because he had tried to take the throne and later he gets killed. He's like down the line. And David looks at him and says, it is my responsibility, my son, to leave a blessing. I will sum up my life in a statement and I leave it to you because you have to choose to receive this blessing, to live it so that you can leave it. Now, whether you're a dad and you have sons, whether you're a mom with daughters or a dad with daughters or a mom with sons, or whether you're a sibling or a coworker or an aunt or an uncle or a boss or an employee, a student, a teacher, the principle applies, my friends. We have a responsibility to live a life that leaves a blessing to the people who are coming behind us. And so I'm sure David in his week and, and, you know, I mean, he's about dead. This is a dude that can't stay warm, can't even get out of bed, barely made it to church. With his dying breath, he says, And you, my son, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. It's really just divided into to two parts. They're important parts. The first one is that life is going to be really busy. Who's busier than a king? And everyone else is going to have a plan for your life. And you may even have a plan for your life. And your plan and their plan may keep you very busy, but that doesn't mean that it's God's plan. And you have to choose to be busy doing the right kind of things. So you listen to God with a whole heart and a clear mind. What better advice could a person give? What better advice could David give? And then he says, be focused and intentional with your life. Life is short. David was 70-ish years old. Don't let discouragement or fear keep you from God's purpose in your life. Pastor Dan, I've asked him to come and share a time when he was able to, to give a blessing to his son, Brady. Uh, as you know, Brady's a state trooper from Missouri and uh, Dan and I, you both know we have a hard time talking about our kids without getting emotional because we love our kids. This is an example where Dan, um, men in his family, were able to give a blessing to, to Brady, Dan's son, as Brady was going into his career from college and starting a, a new project. And as you listen to this, don't just listen to it as a parent. Listen to it as a person. And ask yourself if you are living and leaving these things in the lives of the people who are closest to you. Thanks, Pastor Rick. When you asked me to do that, uh, of course, I've read back over the letter. It's sort of important to prepare, but it's been four years ago. I know this is a passion for you and I because we have boys. And you, we have talked probably more about this sermon series than anything else. Didn't realize it was going to turn into a series, but we want our boys not to be as good. We want them to be better than we are. And so when uh, Brady spent 26 weeks of the Missouri State Highway Patrol trying to drown him, uh, taser him, tear gas him, he made it through, surprisingly. And we had a lunch, and we had my dad, my uh, one living uncle, and my brother, who's a missionary in Jordan, all right, and of course, those who are present speak um, these words. Um, as David said to Solomon, not just nice words, not just encouraging words, but words of life. Whether you're a single parent, whether you're grandparents who mention an aunt, uncle, we have opportunity to invest. And times of celebration are easy, right? I mean, because usually their ears are perked up, perked up. And Rick, you asked me a question as I get done reading this. You, uh, you said, how did Brady respond? And um, his wife said, uh, I've never seen Brady get so emotional and cry. And as a dad, <laughs> I don't want him to cry, but I know that it landed. Right. And so this is 
This is the letter I wrote four years ago. The Missouri Highway Patrol has equipped you physically, mentally, and emotionally, Brady. And for that, I'm grateful. But never forget where your real strength lies, my son. God created each of us on purpose for a purpose. I'm sure by now you have read through Romans 13, 1 through 5. I, I guess it is the men in blues go-to verse in the Bible. It starts in verse 1 with, everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. But verse 4 caught my eye and my heart. It states the authorities are God's servants sent for your good. Brady, if you are both living out his calling for your life and abiding by this verse, then you must spend time talking with him in prayer, reading his word, the Bible, and being filled with the Holy Spirit each day so that you indeed can live this verse and your calling out. As a pastor and not a trooper, I've seen evil, I've seen deception, and I've seen death. But from what I understand, I will not see on the level that you will. And because of that, I will beg God to keep you dependent on him. I will pray for discernment as you quickly evaluate circumstances and have to make split-second decisions. I pray that you take your stress to God and your inner circle of friends and family so that you become better and not bitter. I pray that when failure or shortcomings happen, you, won't, you will own it, you'll learn from it, and move beyond it. I pray for wisdom so that you will learn how to de-escalate volatile situations. My son, I pray for your commitment to God and his values. When it comes to temptation and compromise, for it will come. I pray God give you strength in a supernatural way when you need it. So you can help protect people from those that mean harm. I pray that God grant you the wisdom to know when someone needs a word of, or a hand of encouragement. And of course, I pray God protect you in ways that you won't even be aware of. Uh, almost through. Brady, you are first and foremost a servant of the Most High. You are a shouse with generations of investing and helping people, and you will now represent the great state of Missouri. My son, my prince, in the words of King David to his son and future King Solomon, go show yourself a man, a man of God, a man of love, a man of grace, a man of justice, a man of strength, and a man of courage. God has indeed created you on purpose for this purpose, and it will be for your good and for his glory. Words cannot describe how proud I am of you. Your dad will always be praying and cheering you on. From a dad who prays that Brady and Toby, and Jay and Mitch own these principles, not just know them in their head, but lay them within their heart. Yeah, thank you, Dan. So um, my family and Dan's family, we were blessed to have people who modeled these kinds of things for us. I wrote letters to my boys when they turned 13, um, handwritten letters that were similar. And I, I chuckled because my oldest son, you know, he went to school before my younger son and he was able to read the letter. Uh, my younger son, when he was 13, I handed him the letter and he opened it up and he goes, I can't read this, it's in cursive. He went to a school that didn't teach him how to read cursive. So I had to rewrite that letter for Nathan. But you know, you may not have been from a family like that. That's okay. We're creating a family like this. Right now, down in kids ministry, the volunteers at Joy, they're doing this right now with your little ones. You're in here, they're in there. On Wednesday evening, Brandon is creating this kind of family to invest in your young ones, your teens, your youth, to teach them that their life matters, that they mean something, that God has a plan and that they can be not just significant, but absolutely necessary. We're creating this kind of family because it's the kind of family that God had in mind and it represents the undivided heart. So King David, when he gets to the end, thank you, Dan, when he gets to the end of his life, the apostle Paul wrote this about King David in Acts chapter 13, 36. 
He said, now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation. Now like this, and you may not be able to see this, but the word when is in bold. It's in bold in your notes. When, because God numbers the days that we have. We don't control how many days we have. We don't know. Every time I say that, I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, is it now? God, did I just tempt fate? And I wait and I go, nope, I'm okay, I'm still here. You never know, right? You don't know. Every breath's a gift from God. But when our day comes, and it will come for all of us, and that's okay. When our day comes, this is what was said about David. He had served God's purpose with the people and the projects in his own generation, And then he fell asleep, which is code for he died. I don't know why the Bible chooses to sanitize that and not all the stuff we just read a minute ago. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. So this is what it looks like for us. Now when Rick, now when Dan, now when Lori, when Joy, put your name in here. When, not before, when. I served God's purpose. In my generation, I died. I was buried in the family cemetery and I left this earth behind to be with Jesus. And if we do it the way David did it, not perfect, not neat and clean, not without dysfunction and not without disappointment, but with an undivided and faithful heart, we get to see Jesus when we leave this earth behind and we hear him say, well done, you were good and you were faithful. And friends, we leave the next generation behind equipped to continue this work in a way that's better than we ever could have. Which is why it's not about us. Church is not about me. My family's not about me. My relationships aren't about me. We received the blessing David received, that God has put us here to live our lives for other people. Father, thank you for this series.